If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 26 is where I'll be in just a minute. My dad could beat up your dad. If you were ever in third grade, you probably played that game. But you know who doesn't play the my dad could beat up your dad game? People with dad issues, people whose dads were never there, and people's who, people who are not big fans of their dad. I say that because if you have a, a wonderful view of your dad, then you probably have an advantage on projecting that onto a very good God. But if you had a mean, nasty, rotten, down scoundrel of a dad, you probably project that onto God too. However, he is not like that. So we do not need to make that mistake that the failures of men show us anything about God. And here in Mark 14, we see the failure of men up close. And we don't project that onto God or His Son that His disciples all failed Him. But here as we near the cross in Mark 14 we see that the Lord Jesus does not fail like men. He does not. So let's not project any of these men's failures on to the God-man. But instead, let's look at Mark 14 today and how that we ought to respond in light of Jesus' faithfulness and our failures. If you wouldn't mind to stand in the honor of the reading of the word of the Lord, let's look at how the Lord Jesus separates himself from the pack on his way to the cross. Mark 14, verse 26. And when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to, greatly, to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but you what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let us pray. Father, I I give you praise for the faithfulness of your Son. Help us to respond to him in a way that is faithful to who he is. Thank you for the goodness of Jesus. For he was not affected by the failure of men. Show us him this morning. That he may be the one that we make much of today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all can be seated. So here in Mark 14, Jesus shines like a beacon in the darkness in which that 
the Lord Jesus is better than his best and brightest of followers. As it's been said many times, the best of men are just still men at best. He, my friends, is not just a man. He is not the best of men. He is fully God and fully man. And we look together at his faithfulness when he could have not been. And how we ought to respond in light of this. So since Jesus is faithful, we should not trust in ourselves. So that's what we see at the beginning of verse 26 and 27. A little background to this. After instituting what we now call the Lord's Supper, Jesus goes to the garden or to the Mount of Olives, tells them what's going to happen here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice verse 27. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So first, he said that he will be betrayed. He identified his betrayer at the dinner tells, and, and lets them know it's Judas. The 11 remain who shared the day with him, eating, drinking, learning from his words. All those 11 that remained at the Passover, all of them will fall away. All of them, they will stumble. They were following now, but there would be a time in which that they would be offended by him. And he uses a minor prophet, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, in which the Lord is speaking through the prophet and he's calling someone my shepherd. And he is not talking about an ordinary man, but one who is God's companion. He puts it like this through Zechariah and he's talking about who the shepherd is being in Elite company, as one commentator put it, this shepherd is one side by side with God. He's on God's level. But what happens? That shepherd will be stricken and his sheep will be scattered. But Jesus speaks of restoration in the the next verse. After he's risen, he will go before them to Galilee. Right? We we see that they would all fall away, but they would be brought back. So he's painting this dark picture for his disciples, and he says, you will all fall away because of me. And Peter is sitting there looking at the picture, and he goes, that's not me in there. No, no. Mm -mm. No, that's... Now, I I agree with you that the other ten would be capable. Now, Thaddeus and Andrew, even James and John, I mean, I know their tempers. Like, they're a little snappy, you know what I mean? Like, I could see how that these men would be capable of sin, right? Though all fall away from you, is what he says. I will not deny you. In Peter's own heart, he thought he was the exception to the rule. That he was somehow special, made different than everyone else. And you know what the interesting thing is here in Mark 14 is everyone thought they were special. Everyone thought they were the exception to the rule. To which Jesus is so sure in his knowledge of the future in verse 30 that he begins... To tell, oh, Peter, let me tell you, I know exactly what's going to happen. And then he then begins to give him the specifics of his betrayal. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me. Before it crows twice, you'll deny me three times. As as it's been said, instead of taking up his cross and denying himself, Peter in this moment was running from the cross and denying his Lord. Anti-discipleship is what's going on in the life of Peter. But his response was in verse 31, but he said emphatically, if I must die with you, 
I will not deny you. And they all said the same. So in light of this evidence, Peter was emphatic, fall away, deny you? Absolutely not. If I have to die with you, I will die with you. I will not deny you. I will die. And you know what? Everybody did that. Everybody said that in this moment. He thought he was different. He thought Jesus' words didn't apply to him. He thought he was special. And isn't that true of us? When you, when you hear in the scriptures of God's word about your life and your frailty, your fragility, your propensity to sin, you automatically say, no, no, mm -mm. that's not me. And then what, what else do we do? We look at someone else's life and say, you know, she, she does this. I could see her stepping out on her husband. Like I could see that. Or he, he's like that. Oh yeah. I could see him doing that. I could see him watching stuff he shouldn't watch. I could, I could see that. Or, you know, I could see them. They're, 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 li they're stingy. I could see them do cutting some corners for the IRS. I could see that and them getting caught, but on the news, like I could see that totally. We look, we could see, we can go into other people's lives, right? Because we'll judge them, you know, like we'll judge them. And we'll see their propensity to sin and the weakness in their life, right? If I were to come up to you and say, hey, can you tell me some of my weaknesses? Oh, you'd be able to like, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> got, the, <clears throat> got this list, if I could, which chapter should I, should I start in? You know? Or tell me the list, the, the, the list of your spouse's weaknesses. And you're like, <clears throat> page, I'll just start on page five if that's okay with you, right? Like we see the propensity to sin in everyone else. We see their weaknesses and we could see how that could manifest itself into exploding and ruining their life. I had a meeting years ago in a job I had with somebody that worked over a rehab facility and one of the, they were talking through their program and he said, what we tell these guys here in this program is none of us can see the back of our heads. None of us can see the back of our heads. That's why mine is never combed, if you're curious. I just comb the front because why would I comb the back? I can't even see it. That's a side note. But the point of it is, is none of us can see very clearly our propensity to sin. You can see yours, other, your spouses, you can see your friends or someone else in the church, but not us. That's Peter's attitude right here. It's like, though they all might do that, it's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to do that. However, that is dangerous. That is dangerous. It came out several years ago. They did a, a survey of fallen pastors in which that they committed adultery on their spouses all together within 24 months. They took this survey of these men who had cheated on their wives within a 24 month span. And they looked at it and they surveyed them and very, various aspects of their lives were put down on paper. And to the best of their discernment and ability, these were born again, legitimate Christians as far as they could tell. And they surveyed these four men and they'd all, they had a bunch of things in common. They'd all ceased on, all but ceased in daily Bible reading plans. They all but ceased in a time of personal prayer and worship. More than 80% of the men had the, developed the relationship in sp spending isolated time alone with the woman in, through counseling times. 
yet, and as we're going through this, right, you can obviously see these markers. These are signs. They're blaring. And you go, I could see how this is the road paved to destruction for these men's lives. I can see it. Can't you? Can't you see that this is what destruction looks like and these, this is how you get there? You neglect your Bibles. You neglect your prayer. You neglect your spouse and you spend time with someone else's. I could see that. But the most striking finding of the research is each of the 246 men surveyed had one glaring thing in common. Each of the 246 had this response. I never thought that it would happen to me. I never thought that it would happen to me. If you somehow think that you're made of something different, like that you're made of different material than someone else, that you are somehow above and beyond this call of discipleship and holiness in the Christian life. If you think you're above and beyond that to where we can just assume holiness as, a per, as opposed to pursue holiness, if that's you and you don't ever think it would happen to you, you're already on the way. You're already on the way to destruction. The only question is, how far are you down that road? The road you're going on is one of destruction. The question is, how far are you down the road? And can you hear this voice and turn around? Can you hear this voice and turn around? Don't go to the end. Don't go to the end. Turn around. I know you don't think it can happen to you. I know that other people, it may bother other people to do that, but it won't bother you. No, no. Turn around. Turn around. Listened to the propensity to sin to Jesus' followers here. That is what the problem is with this scenario. That, that Peter's estimation of himself is in exact opposition to what Jesus says the possible sin lurking in his life looks like. Right? Like Peter thinks he's this and Jesus knows he's that. See the difference? Peter thinks he's this and Jesus knows he's that. And those two are not the same. So if you don't see the potential lurking, if you don't see the potential lurking in your life to completely destroy things, like if you couldn't ever imagine a world in which that something in you could destroy you, something done by you, words you say, and decisions you make, if you don't see that possibility... I don't know how far you're down that road, but you are down that road, my friends. You are headed down the road of destruction. Hear, repent, and turn. Now, we, we, we can look at that survey, right? That's just powerful. <laughs> but that's pastors, and they have a platform, and they have unique pressures and unique temptations and unique enemies that some of us may never have. No, 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 no. That's not true. That's just the attitude of it. It, it could happen to them, right? That's, that's just stretching it out further, saying, I, I could see how it could happen to you, Pastor, but I don't see how that could happen to me. It could. It very well could. Now, I'm not trying to scare you into saying that you're going to throw away everything you hold dear and that you were a Christian this morning and you went to bed and tomorrow you could wake up and not be a Christian. That's not what we're talking about here. Paul in Philippians, but I, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. The day of Jesus Christ But what we see with these disciples is something that we often ignore. Not that someone can be a Christian one day and then wake up the next day and not be a Christian. But that people who name the name of Christ can sin. 
bigly. There's that, right? Largely. They can sin. We can sin. You can sin. It is crouching at your door desiring to have you. Jesus told Peter before this in another gospel, Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that you might endure. You know he desires to have you. And if you're a Christian, he's never going to get you, so to speak. But he will, can certainly ruin your life and your marriage and your relationship with your kids or your parents. The thing we're ignoring that we see in this verse is because we look at Judas and he sinned greatly. But so did Peter. So did Peter. What's the difference? What's the difference in Judas and Peter? One of them repented with godly sorrow. One repented with worldly sorrow. They were both really sorry that these things happened, that they did these things. They're both really sorry about that. Peter was really a Christian. So he committed this great travesty and he turned. And once he was restored, he came back. Judas went out into the night, never to come back again. And we ignore this one great truth. They both sinned greatly. Both Peter and Judas So if you're a Christian, you'll never be a Judas. But you might be a Peter. He was so emphatic with you. Deny you, forget it. I will not deny you. I will die with you. And you know how that he went into this? He did not agree with Jesus' assessment of him. He trusted in himself. If I must die... I will not deny. And everybody else said that. You know, so quote of Philippians. Paul said, he who began a good work will finish it. Why? Because it's his work. But who is Peter talking about here in this verse? His work. Peter's talking about his own work and not the work of God in his life. So the reason that you might fail miserably in following Jesus or sin greatly is because you're trusting in you some. You disregard Jesus' assessment of you that you are just flesh and bone. The spirit indeed is willing and the flesh is weak. You disregard that and you think, I've got this. I can handle it. And you won't. And you don't. But Jesus is faithful. And because he's faithful, we should not trust in ourselves like Peter did. And we should set our will aside like Jesus does. Here beginning in verse 32. So there's two comparisons here as we enter into the garden as Jesus tells his disciples to sit and watch and pray, right? There's all these professions before this garden. Before the garden, Jesus says, you will all fall away. They say, no, we won't. Jesus says, stand here and pray while I go over there and pray. And he's in Gethsemane and it's what the... Hebrew word for that is olive press. And was Jesus ever pressed in this moment as he goes into the garden, taking with him Peter and James and John, verse 34, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. In context and elsewhere, we know that they ought to be praying here in verse 34. 
And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, this hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you, what you will. So what's happening here? It sounds like Jesus, who as we travel through the end of Mark, that he's made all these decisions, picking a fight sometimes it seems with the religious leaders, like that he is to the cusp of this moment of his own death and somehow what? He gets cold feet, he steps back. What, what, is, what is going on here? Why is his soul sorrowful in this moment? Why does he feel like he could die right now? Well, we look at this and need to understand a couple of things. That he was God of very God. He is God of very God. And yet he remains and is a man like us. Though he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, like it is so sure what's going to happen, he is God like God, but yet he's God wrapped in skin like us. And he's sorrowful to death and he falls down in this moment and he's praying. And another gospel writer tells us that he's sweating drops of blood. He's contracted a condition called hematohydrosis. I googled it. Don't be impressed with me. I googled it. It may occur in individuals dealing and experiencing extreme stress. And in this extreme stress, he made all of these decisions beforehand to bring him to the moment, and why is now the stressful moment for him? Well, the answer is, is in the context of the verse in verse 36. What is he anxious about? Where is the anxiety coming from? There's a cup he's getting ready to drink. And he's wanting it to pass. So what cup is this? It's important to know that he is God in the flesh. God in man. The God man. 100% God and 100% man. So that means that Jesus had a human nature like ours. So he was hungry like we are. He was sad like we are. He got sick like we are. All of these things. And what's happening here in this moment is Jesus is preparing himself for the cross and he's getting ready to drink this cup. This is where the, the, the elephants bathe in the scriptures. What I mean by that is the scriptures are like water in which the, so shallow that children can play in them and so deep in which the elephants can bathe, meaning on the shallow end, he is God and man. We understand that. But on the deep end, how do those two natures relate to each other? In Colossians 1, he was participating in holding all things together. Yet he had to eat lunch. Or he might get a little weak. And he had to eat, eat dinner lest his blood sugar might drop. Now, he had a nature like we did. And his human nature is choosing in this moment to, be, to take this cup. Don't you know that inside you there is built in because of the very design and nature of God, that God creates these bodies to live and to preserve themselves, to continue and to remain. He makes us to live. And Jesus in his human nature is understanding in this moment, taking this cup. And taking this cup means dying on the cross. 
What is this cup? Psalm 11, the writer talks of God raining coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Job 21.20, Job talks about the wicked, letting us know that their eyes see destruction and letting them drink the wrath of the Almighty. Psalm 75.8, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup of foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. My friends, this is the wrath of God. Because God is holy and righteous and just and He dwells in an approachable light and He created man in His own image and man who was created in His own image rebelled against God and therefore the wages of sin is death so there is this death, wrath, punishment that is to be poured out like from a cup from God to the sinner. And what's going on here in this moment is Jesus is purposefully setting his mind to drink the cup of wrath that you deserve, my friends. This cup had your name on it. This was your cup. This is your cup. Because you're not like, because Peter was wrong. I will never do this. I could never sin. No, 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 no. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You fell short and you deserve this drink. And many of our friends and family are having this cup poured out on them which will result and eternally happen forever in hell. Many of our friends will drink the fullness of, of this wrath for an infinite amount of time in hell, separated from the pleasure of God. And the truth is, is that you should too. You should have, that's where you should be. That's what you should do. You should, drink, you should be the one drinking this cup for yourself because you deserve it. You did it, not him. He knew no sin. What's happening here in the garden? He is becoming sin for us that in him we might receive the righteousness of God. We don't deserve any of those things. We deserve this wrath. We deserve this cup. Because we've lied before. We've taken things that didn't belong to us. We've not loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength through our neighbor as ourself. Do not forget that he took the cup for you. Don't come entitled today. You know what your entitlement is? This cup. This cup. But yet, what does Jesus do here? He's struggling in his human nature, right? That this is a cup. And if we could go about this any other way, please let this cup pass from me. The Father clearly says no. Because he says, nevertheless, not what I will but what you will. You see the difference here between Jesus and you? you? See the difference here between Jesus and Peter and all of the best and brightest of people that went to his three and a half years seminary? You see the difference here? They were trusting in themselves, looking toward their will. I will never do this. Did you catch that in the earlier in the, in the chapter? I will never. And then here is Jesus in the garden saying, not as I will, but as you will. The difference between Jesus and you is he's more faithful than you. Because he doesn't trust, he wasn't trusting in himself. He trusted in his father. And he set aside his will. 
and he set aside his will. That's what he did. You see, that's how that God purchased salvation in his son by a son who did not trust in himself but in his father and who set aside his will to the will of the father. That is how, my friends, Jesus is faithful because he does those things. And in all things, he is our example. He is. So much so that we should not trust in ourselves. Just like taking a toddler through a parking lot. Do you really trust them? Do you really trust a toddler in a parking lot? Are you foolish enough to do that? You trust their hand to hold yours? Or you say, no, I don't trust their grip, but I do mine, right? (laughs) Yeah, hold my hand. More so, I'm holding your hand. You see what I'm saying there? That is what God is doing. He doesn't trust your hand. He knows it's, it's silly to, to trust your hand. So why would you trust your hand? Why would you do that? Why would you trust in yourself like Peter? He's prone to fall. We trust him who began the good work in us to finish it. Not me to finish it. I didn't begin it, so I can't finish it. We trust in him, is what we do. And what do we look at in this verse, but we see that we can learn from their failings in his victory in this. We learn in their failings because Jesus is here praying in the garden, and they're bragging about staying with Jesus when they won't even stop to pray with Jesus. So how do we not fail like these people? How do we be faithful like Jesus? Well, let's look at these two groups. Which one was faithful? The one who was praying and awake? As opposed to the one who was asleep instead of praying? I know things are difficult and everybody's situation is different, but Don't brag about how you're going to stay with Jesus if you won't even pray with Jesus. In fact, don't brag about staying with Jesus at all. Brag about Jesus staying with you (laughs) because they all left. Yet he brought them back. That's what he did. He would restore them. He would restore Peter. He was going to deny him three times. He fell asleep three times. He's going to come back and restore him and say, Simon, do you love me? Three times. We don't need to presume he's going to restore us, though. Do you understand that? Do not presume and assume that if you fall asleep in prayer for the rest of your life, wake up and destroy your life, that God somehow owes you a restoration. No. No, no, no. Don't presume upon the faithfulness of God to persist in sin. I don't think that's what this teaches us at all. No. We shouldn't trust in ourselves at all. You know you what <laughs> you don't know what you are capable of. But God knows what you are capable of as far as sin goes. And he never ca- causes you to be strong in yourself. No. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might, not yours. So we don't trust in ourselves, and we certainly set aside our will. We look at these things knowing that we are capable of doing the same evil as the disciples did. But yet, Jesus is more faithful than us because he set aside his will and he submitted to the will of the Father. And you see here that he won this battle in the garden in spite of the disciples losing it. 
And that that is just a little small picture of what he did for you. You fell short of the glory of God. There was one, my friends, who did not fall short of the glory of God. But his very face was the glory of God. And he won, even though I lost. But now, I am in him. So we don't look at ourselves, but we look at him who won the battle. Because here in the verse, they claimed they would die for him, but they're losing. They're losing it. Verse 37, they found him sleeping, and he said to them, are you asleep? Could you not watch an hour at this point? Peter said he would, like, I would die for you. Okay, sit over there and pray a minute, and we'll see how that goes. I would do anything for Jesus. Will you pray with me? I'm just busy, you know? Everybody's busy, aren't we? Aren't we just, uh, you know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Verse 38, watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. That's what we do, right? That's our parting from this verse that we, Jesus tells them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you're a Christian, I don't know if he's talking about the human spirit. I'm pretty sure it's the Holy Spirit, though, in which that, that sp- the Christian now has the Holy Spirit to where this is good news for us, my friends. You do not have to sin. Right? You have a propensity to sin greatly. But you don't have to. Why? The Spirit is willing. The problem is that the flesh is weak, though. And you are housed in it. And influenced by it. So what does Jesus give them as a prescription? Watch and pray. Pray, pray, pray. Do not set prayer aside. Set your will aside. And how do we set our wills aside? Prayer. Prayer. Lost people, the unconverted, whatever you want to call them, non-Christians, they cannot submit to God because their flesh is hostile to Him. The one whose mind is set on the flesh is death. There's nothing in them that would... Go toward God. No. But he's saying, you're not like that. The Spirit is willing. Problem is, though, the flesh is weak. And do you see that Jesus is going to war against his flesh in this moment and the temptations therein? He's going to war here. Meanwhile, his disciples who boast with their mouths are falling asleep with their lives. Do you see the difference between him and you? Here in these verses. So do not brag. Do not brag about your spiritual gifts, your time spent in the service, being the Christian service. What you would do for the Lord. No. No. Just trust in him instead of you. Set your will aside. And how do you do that? Just pray. Pray, pray, pray. That's what you should do. Because Jesus is faithful. Jesus is more faithful than you. He's more faithful than me. And every bragger who makes the claims that they are like him or that they, what they would do for him. Aren't you tired in our day about what everyone is talking about? Everyone loves to talk about themselves and what they would do. But if, like, we are in the boat with these disciples in which we don't talk about ourselves, we talk about what Jesus has done. And what did Jesus do? He won the battle for us that we could not win for ourselves because God is holy and righteous and just and we are not. We should have had that cup and Jesus drank it. So if you're not a Christian today, that cup is headed towards you, the wrath and fury and punishment and anger of God. But there is good news. Though you have lost, though you deserve the cup, 
Jesus drank the cup in your place. He died on the cross for your sin. And he rose on the third day victorious. So if you're not a Christian today, turn from your sin and trust. Make your whole life on the Lord Jesus. If you are a Christian, Hebrews 3.12, take care, brothers, lest there be an unbelieving heart in any of you that would cause you to fall away from the living God. Look at yourself. Know your propensity to sin. What is your propensity to pray? That's the question. Are you doing it intentionally? You see, that's how Jesus went to war. He went to prayer. Are you going to be a casualty? Decide right now. Or are you going to be a prayer? Are you going to be a casualty? Someone whose lunch that Satan ate. Or are you going to be a man and woman of prayer? Which one? The example of our Lord is one who went to war in prayer. That he might drink the cup. That he might set aside his will. That he might go through to the cross and die on the cross for our sins. And my friends, he did. He won. He won the victory on the cross, up from the grave. So now you don't have to sin. He broke Satan's power by the sacrifice of himself. So look at your heart. Look at your prayer closet. You can show off in here and you can show off out there, but you cannot show off before God in prayer because who you are is who you are before God. And the clearest example of that is who you are in prayer. So as we go, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let's pray. Oh God, have mercy on us that we would not fall like everyone else, that we would not sin like everyone else the only difference between us and them is you. The only difference between us and them is you. By the grace of God, we are what we are. Have mercy on us, please. Make us people of prayer. Please help us. In Jesus' name, amen.